Today on Applied Science, I'd like to talk about lead crystal glassware. That's right, back in the day they used to put quite a lot of lead into these fine crystalline wine glasses. In fact, the standard was 24% lead by mass. And so the question is, how much of it leaches out into the beverage you're drinking? Uh, the short answer is, in a worst case scenario, it's about one day's worth of average lead intake. So you might be surprised to learn that if you're an average adult, you're already eating about 10 to 50 micrograms of lead per day. And in a worst case, you would get about that much lead from drinking from a lead crystal glassware glass for an evening. But there's a lot of variation. I've spent the last month studying about five or six different kinds of lead crystal glassware made in different countries at different time points and uh, extracting them under various scenarios, heavy use, light use, recovery times. And so I put all my results together and published them onto GitHub and I'm happy to answer questions in the comments here. And in today's video, I'll kind of summarize the method and uh, just sort of give you my whole take on lead crystal glassware. So what is lead crystal? Well, it's not crystal. <laughs> no, it's actually just regular plain old glass into which lead has been dissolved. And don't think that at the glass making factory, they have, you know, a big vat of molten glass and they toss in like a chunk of metal lead and kind of mix it around. No, no. It actually usually start with a lead compound. This one is lead oxide, known to its friends as red lead, because uh, it really has a very nice color to it. And it dissolves into there like sugar into water. It completely goes into solution and loses its red color and just becomes an integral part of the glass. So the next question is, why on earth would you do that? Well, just like dissolving sugar into water, it changes the density and the optical properties of the glass. And so with a heavier density, you can make the glass thinner and still have good heft to it so it still feels substantial enough. And with a higher index of refraction, when you look through the glass, the little cuts and made into the crystal bend the light more. And it also has higher internal reflection, so it sparkles kind of like a gemstone. And in addition, it also makes the glass more dispersive, so it will create rainbows more willingly than a regular piece of glass. Uh, also, it makes the glass um, ring kind of a long time, and I think that's just a function of it being denser and a, a thinner glass. But then finally, it also makes the glass softer, so that at the factory where they're cutting these intricate patterns into it and needing to polish them, uh, the cutting tools will last longer. And on top of all that, lead is really cheap. So if you get all these benefits uh, for, for minimal cost, it's a no-brainer, uh, if lead were non-toxic. Unfortunately, there is no safe level of lead. Um, a lot of metals in the world are toxic in high doses, but are required for life in low doses. Lead is not one of them. There really is no biological function that relies on lead. So zero is really the ideal number. Now, a regulatory agency can't say that the limit for lead is truly zero because our modern analysis and concentration techniques are so well developed that we can always find a few atoms of lead anywhere. Uh, lead is even totally naturally occurring in the soil. Um, it's much higher now since industrialization, but even before, you know, there's a fair bit of lead in the soil and it will get into groundwater and eventually make its way into your tap. So the government has to pick a number uh, that they declare is more or less safe, at least with our current knowledge of lead and everything. And that number in the U.S. is 15 micrograms per liter. That's the EPA's so-called action level, meaning that if you test the water coming to your house and it's more than 15 micrograms per liter, you can take action and try to, you know, sue your water municipality or whatever. Um, but just to give some context, so if you drank a liter of water every day and your house was, you know, a little bit under the limit, you're already getting somewhere between 10 and 15 micrograms of lead just from that liter of tap water, coffee and tea and cooking and just drinking out of the tap. So just to give some context, in a lot of the stuff I've read online about lead, no one ever has any numbers. They just talk about how bad it is, which is true, but if you knew the numbers, then you'd know how bad it is, and that gives a lot more context. To give some sense of scale to these tiny masses, keep in mind that a grain of salt is somewhere between 1 and 200 micrograms or if you're into electronics, an 0201 surface mount resistor. So in order to create a, a 15 microgram per liter solution, you'd have to dissolve that one grain of salt in over 10 liters of water. And one microgram in one liter of water, which is weighs a kilogram, is a part per billion. Um, you've probably heard of this parts per notation, especially in regards to water quality. But it's actually a very confusing unit. In fact, I gave a whole talk at Supercon last year uh, showing why you should never use the parts per notation. 
Um, there was a, a very near airplane accident, a dual engine failure on takeoff caused by a technician that was trying to interpret ambiguous instructions given in parts per million and ended up adding way too much fuel additive to the plane's tanks and uh, the engines choked on this additive and they, they nearly crashed. And so a much smarter way to describe this would be milligrams of additive per kilogram of fuel, still part per million, but it's very obvious now what you have to use. And this applies to any kind of parts per notation. In fact, the one you're probably familiar with would be parts per hundred, otherwise known as percent. So you could just say kilograms per kilogram instead of saying percent, and it just conveys exactly what you mean. So anyway, getting back to the lead crystal, I uh, originally this whole video came about because I wanted to design and build an atomic absorption spectrometer, which is a piece of equipment that is ideally suited for measuring tiny trace levels of metals in water. Uh, but as I kind of thought about this you know, demonstration a little bit more, I was getting more and more interested in the lead crystal itself rather than demonstrating the spectrometer. And I thought, you know, I should really just make the whole video centered on the question of lead crystal, because in my mind that became kind of a lot more interesting. And I also knew that I was probably not able to build a absorption spectrometer that would be accurate enough to go all the way down to, you know, single digit or tens of micrograms per liter. So now I had to find a way that I could do this in the lab here that was accurate to very low levels um, and was potentially easier, I mean, or quicker to build than a spectrometer. Um, if you're new to the channel, you might be asking, well, why didn't I just send the samples to an analysis lab? Clearly, I could have just collected the samples from the lead crystal and sent them to a modern analysis lab and have a very accurate number. But that's just not really what applied science is about. The whole point of this channel is to show what you can do in a home shop with, you know, the resources of one person and spending some dedicated time. So luckily, I found a pretty good solution. Um, in the 1950s and prior, before anyone had an atomic absorption spectrometer, uh, this magic chemical was used called dithiazone. For some reason, I always pronounced it dithazone because it sounds like some kind of funny psychoactive. But no, it is dithiazone. And the reason it's magic is that it changes color in response to being mixed with metals that are in solution. It has this whole rainbow of outputs. And each one, is in each color is um, idiosyncratic for that metal. So if you have a high concentration of copper, you can just look at it and tell that it's copper because it changed to that uh, color. Now this works really well in the part per million range, or I should say milligrams, milligrams per liter range. Um, you don't need a spectrometer, you can just look at it with your eye and identify what metal it is based on the color. But if you want to get down to really low levels, micrograms per liter, everything gets way more difficult. Um, the, the quality of the water, the quality of all the reagents, everything has to be extremely, extremely clean because this chemical doesn't just test for lead, it tests for five or ten different metals. And you have to make sure that all of the reagents that you use and all of the glassware and all the plastic and the caps and the pipette tips and everything are, have no contamination of any metals that might react with this and um, you know, cause a false high reading. All right, enough chit chat. Let's see some chemistry here. I'll show you one of the analytical runs that I've been developing over the past month. So we'll start off with about 5 ml of dithiazone dissolved in dichloromethane. And I'm going to use these large pipettes to move it, which is a real time saver. Um, using graduated cylinders instead of these quick pipettes is um, much slower. And to this, I'm going to add 30 ml of a stock solution. This is a lead standard that I've created that is 750 micrograms per liter. And so we'll put 30 ml of that in. And I managed to find a, um, one of these pipettes that is 10 ml per shot. So I realize this isn't as accurate as using a single graduated cylinder that's 30. But uh, <laughs> believe me, this is the least source of error in my whole system here. So this is going to be fine. Now, what we could do right now is shake it if we want. Oh, first you'll notice that the dithiazone has this turquoise color, and that is inherent to the chemical itself. Before it's mixed with any metals, it has this bluish greenish color. And you can see that on the spectrometer. You can just you know, take a, straight, a sample straight from the amber bottle and put it into the spectrometer and see what the absorption profile is to get this amber green color. Um, if you haven't used, uh, Separatory funnels with a high volatility compound like dichloromethane, give it a couple of shakes to start and then cap it or decap it to let some of the uh, vapor escape. 
Now you'll see that the color isn't really changing. Um, the uh, dichloromethane is not soluble in water, so it doesn't dissolve into it. It will actually separate out into another layer. But what's important here is that the color isn't changing. And the reason for that is that the lead standard that I just used, the 750 microgram per liter, is acidified. There's a half a percent acetic acid in all of the aqueous solutions that I've used in the whole experiment. All of them, the standards, the extraction, they're all half a percent acetic acid. And I used the most pure, you know, USP pharmaceutical ultra high quality acetic acid and trusted that this was free of metals. So we can see that after the layers have separated, it's still that blue green color. So what we do in order to get the, the lead to move from the aqueous layer into the dichloromethane layer is we're going to raise the pH here. And to do that, I'm going to add three milliliters of 3% ammonium hydroxide, which I cleaned myself by boiling ammonium hydroxide and bubbling the resulting ammonia gas through ultra pure water. And so we'll put in three ml of this. and give it a shake. And you can see right away, we've got a pretty significant color change. So now, uh, pink is the characteristic color for lead. So when diphyzone mixes with lead, you get this brilliant pink color. I think it's called carmine red or whatever. That, that's, that's the name of that color. And at 750 micrograms per liter, we just got a huge change. So the idea is that with enough stock solutions, if we go down through the line, if I keep diluting this uh, lead standard stock solution all the way down to zero in small increments, we'll get less and less color change. So the way that we read a result from this is to get a little glass cuvette, a 10 millimeter glass cuvette, and slowly, carefully drain, first I let a few drops out anyway, and then drain that into the cuvette and put a cap on it, which is important because the dichloromethane will start evaporating and the, the level in this cuvette will go down just due to natural evaporation. So put a cap on it. And then within about you know, 20 minutes, get this thing into the spectrometer and measure the real color that we just obtained. A couple of interesting things to note. Uh, we put 30 ml of, of water aqueous sample in there, and we had 5 ml of dichloromethane with the dithizone, with the dithizone in there. And there's sort of a natural uh, concentration effect. We could have just as easily put 50 milliliters of aqueous sample in there, and all of that would have been transferred into the dithizone, into the organic layer, uh, due to this shaking process and the raising of the pH, which causes the, the lead ion to move into the organic layer. So in theory, you could keep going. I mean, you could, if you wanted more sensitivity, you could just keep using bigger and bigger aqueous samples, go all the way up to 200 or 500 milliliters of aqueous sample. As long as you can shake it with that tiny amount of dithizone, you'll concentrate all of the lead that was in that aqueous sample into the dithizone. And then the color change will become more sensitive because you've got this bigger concentration factor. So once I realized I could do that, I was confident that we would have a really sensitive technique and we can just adjust the sample volume up and down to, to, to basically make the test as sensitive or as insensitive as you want. One of the difficulties that I ran into in this experiment was making the lead standard solutions. Um, you really wanna have a high degree of trust in these solutions because this is how we're gonna relate all of the analysis results back to the real world. We need to generate a calibration curve and the only way to know that it's any good is to trust these uh, known concentrations totally. So I used lead acetate to make these, which might have been a mistake in retrospect, but it's what I had in stock and I thought it would be good because I knew I was going to be using acetic acid for the extraction solutions. And I thought, well, it'll be exactly comparable. But anyway, if you're redoing this, you might want to consider using lead nitrate. Um, so I didn't trust the purity of the crystals that I bought. I bought lead acetate and then decided to recrystallize it, which is a standard practice in chemistry to dissolve your substance that you want to purify into a solvent, which is hot water in this case. And then you lower the temperature of the solvent, which makes the crystals less soluble and will start forming crystals. And as the crystal grows, if you grow it really slowly, it will push impurities out of the crystal as it forms. 
Then you collect the crystals, wash them, and now you have pure crystals. And you can do this process several times even. So I did, and then I dissolved the resulting ultra pure, you know, lead and acetate crystals in ultra pure water and got this very cl concerning cloudy solution. I was really concerned that there was uh, sediment or something non-soluble in there. But what was even stranger is that upon immediately adding the crystals to the water, it would be clear. And after you know a minute or two, it would form this very concerning cloudiness. And I, tried, I searched around and tried all kinds of things and could never figure out what the problem was. I tried, you know, different sources of water, different ways to recrystallize it, grinding them in different ways and this and that. And finally, this is my funny chat GPT story. I just asked chat GPT the most vague way, what would cause a solution of lead acetate to become cloudy? And shockingly enough, it had the answer immediately. Its first response was absolutely what this is. Uh, it said that it's just dissolved CO2 in the water uh, reacting with the lead acetate and causing it to precipitate. It's forming lead carbonate. And that's what this precipitate is. Very interesting. It even uh, followed it up by saying, if you don't want that to happen, you can bubble an inert gas through your water, which will displace the CO2, and then it will no longer form lead carbonate in these ultra pure solutions. And it was right. I, I tried this and it was absolutely spot on. But once I realized that that was the problem, uh, that's when I decided to acidify all of my test solutions, knowing that there, these solutions are going to have to be acidic to stay, to have the lead acetate stay in solution. Um, that's another way of doing it without worrying about bubbling, you know, nitrogen through the water or whatever. So I made all of my test solutions half a percent by volume acetic acid, and then added the lead um, acetate crystals to it and got perfectly clear solutions. Another problem that I ran into was my source of water, or more specifically, the way I was storing it. Um, I knew, obviously, you can't use tap water for this because it's full of, you know, all kinds of metals at, you know, the low microgram per liter level. So you can't use that. So I used filtered reverse osmosis deionized water, and you can buy an RODI filter on Amazon for, you know, one or 200 bucks, I think. And the water that comes out of these is, is actually very good. But I found out if you store it in a cheap plastic jug that I also bought from Amazon, it's no longer so pure anymore. And I suspect it's actually the spigot. Uh, it has some colored plastic in the spigot. And I think there was probably some residue of the um, pigment that goes into that plastic spigot that was coming out in the water. And I could tell that this was a problem because fresh water that came right out of my RODI system didn't change the color of the dithiazone when I went through this extraction and test process. But water that had been stored in this carboy for, you know, a couple of weeks was not pure. It changed the color of the diathizone. I don't think it was lead, but it was some other metal that was gonna cause interference with our measurements here. So then I only would store my RODI water in glass bottles with Teflon tops. So there was no exposure to this weird Amazon colored spigot water problem there. Let's talk about the measurement of these samples. So we've just finished with the chemistry, the wet side, and created all these solutions of different colors. And now we need to measure the colors to translate them into a lead concentration. So in our setup here, we've got a tungsten illuminator there. It's just a light bulb with a ground glass screen to diffuse the light, some distance to adjust the intensity a little bit, and a holder to hold the cuvette. This one just has pure um, dichloromethane in there without even any dithiazone. Put that in there. And then we have a 3D printed lens holder that samples about an eight millimeter diameter of light and focuses it down into a fiber optic. And the fiber optic goes to an LR1 spectrometer, which gives us the, the readout of, of all the different wavelengths hitting it. And so the idea here is that we wanna measure the absorbance of these different colored solutions. And we're gonna use the, the clear uh, dichloromethane as the reference point. So all of the non-flat stuff, like the light bulb doesn't have a flat curve, the, the fiber optic isn't flat, like you know the absorbance of the glass in here isn't flat. And we basically wanna compensate for all that, which is what measuring the absorbance does. So I, um, I have the LR1 save a file to the file system every second every second you can save a, a text file that has the whole spectra. And that's already averaged about 50 samples. And the reason I did that is because I, there is actually a programming API, but I, I was really running out of time and didn't have enough time to look into it. And so for my 
uh, Octave Script, which is basically a MATLAB open source alternative. It looks at the directory, and when it finds a new file, it knows that new data has come in. So you can use this in real time. And the script is a little UI where you can, you know, tell it what samples you're going to do and then click a button to go to the next sample. Okay, so after putting all that together, uh, this is what we end up with. A normal a absorbance curve for each of the samples based on the blank, using that as the, the reference. And I also call this normalized absorbance because what I do is bring the curves down so that they always hit zero between 750 and 800 nanometer. Um, the rationale there being if there's like a water droplet stuck to the cuvette or an air bubble or something else, it will affect the total absorbance even in the infrared, whereas if it's a pure sample with no bubbles or anything, it really should have the same absorbance at that level. So if we look at this curve, I have two blanks, uh, dark blue and this red color, and those are both almost on top of each other, a flat line at one. And that makes sense because we just calculated the absorbance from those two samples, so those should definitely be one. Um, the reason I do two is because I measure one blank at the beginning of the run and one blank at the end of the run and check if there was a difference between them. And if there is, that means that something with the light source changed or the fiber optic cable got kinked or something changed so that the samples may not be comparable to each other. But anyway, the interesting bit is the absorbance curves from these solutions. And you can see this was a calibration run. And so I sampled known concentrations of lead and you can see all the curves here. So for a zero, we have this dark blue curve that has maximum absorbance at about uh, 610. And the highest lead concentration, 2000 micrograms per liter, has maximum absorption at about 515 nanometers. And all of the curves in between these two extremes are intermediate amounts of lead and intermediate amounts of absorbance. So traditionally, the way that this is done is to just measure the absorbance at one wavelength. 515 nanometers. All the literature that I've read says you measure the absorbance at 515 and that tells you how much lead is in the solution. And if we do that, we end up with a calibration curve that looks like this. So this is the absorbance at 515 nanometers and this is the concentration in micro micrograms per liter. And you can see that the curve has kind of an S shape even though I didn't fit it all the way out. Uh, the reason for that is that the high concentrations we've basically saturated all the dithiazone in the system. There's so much lead that it can't get any more pink than pink. So every single dithiazone molecule is bound to lead and it's now pink. At the low end, there's also a little bit of flattening of the curve, which was concerning to me. I thought we were losing sensitivity down at the very low end. And so I thought about this a little bit more and it's kind of a shame to throw out all this data. Uh, part of the reason that all of the literature says that you must just measure absorbance at 515 is because the last time that there was development going on for diethizone measurement of lead was, you know, 1950 or something. I mean, other equipment surpassed the method by far. And so it's been a long time since anyone has really used diethizone as a serious research tool for good reason. But anyway, since we have the whole spectra, I thought, you know, it makes a lot more sense to use the whole spectrum. So I came up with this idea of recording the profile from zero lead and recording the profile from the saturated lead, 2000 micrograms in this case, and using those as reference points uh, in a function minimizer. So what we wanna do is basically find a linear combination of those two waveforms to test all the other intermediate waveforms. Now that sounds kind of silly, but think of it this way, like the rationale is that the dithiazone is green, and if it binds to lead, it turns pink. So there is no purple color. Like, that's really just a linear combination of the green and the pink. And so what we're doing in the computer is asking it to find the coefficients. What do I multiply the green by? What do I multiply the saturated pink by to get all those other intermediate um, spectra. And the cool thing is it does this across the entire spectrum. Or I actually set it to go from 400 to 700. Um, here's the code for it. Uh, if we are in the calibration run, here it is, the uh, function minimizer. So this is basically like the optimizer in um, 
Microsoft Excel or lots of other tools. And you basically don't know what these two coefficients are. One coefficient is for the pink, the other coefficient is for the green. And we just tell the computer, it, you, you figure out what the two coefficients are to generate our target waveform from those two base waveforms, completely unsaturated and completely saturated diphthizone. So it does that. And if we plot the coefficient for the saturated diphthizone against how much lead was in that solution, we end up with this really beautiful linear curve. And I've actually cut off the top measurement because it did saturate, you know, there's no point in drawing it to 2000. So these are the intermediate measurements from zero to 750 micrograms of lead per liter. And it's nice and linear and repeatable and everything. And I like this method because it compensates for differing amounts of unreacted diphthizone. I didn't mention, I mean, if you can, you can see from this graph, the, the zero uh, still has some absorbance at 515. And I, I didn't mention that the amount of unreacted diphthizone is very sensitive to the pH of the aqueous layer. So if you don't control the pH to a super tight degree, some of that diphthizone will oxidize and get pulled into the aqueous layer. So it won't be green anymore, it'll be clear. Um, and like I say, even though we've done everything we can to control the pH, there's still a chance that something's not working there. So one of the benefits of this coefficient method is that even if the amount of unreacted diphthizone changes in the organic layer, this will compensate for that, and that coefficient will be lower, but it won't affect the coefficient of the saturated, at least as far as, as I think. So I was pretty excited about this new method since I haven't really seen it anywhere, and it, it produced very good results. and. The only thing I didn't test was, uh, is it very resistant to other metals? Like if you put copper or zinc or mercury, in theory, this would also be fairly resistant to those because it wouldn't follow the lead profile. Like this thing knows exactly what the profile should be for uh, saturate lead or diphthizone saturated with lead. Um, and if it was some other metal, copper or whatever, it wouldn't have that same profile. So anyway, I, I thought using the whole spectrum was good, and, and that's the method that I used to find the concentration and all these unknowns. Okay, let's talk about the final results. Uh, the first test I did was just to pour uh, the extraction fluid, which is half percent acetic acid in pure water, into the glass, and then sample it one hour later. And that's what this first group of numbers are here. Um, the reason that the axes aren't zoomed in a little bit more is because we had some high readings later. But you can see that we're at about 250 micrograms per liter for a couple of them, and a couple of them were zero. Uh, so that's already pretty interesting. And this is, when I say a couple of them, I mean two out of the, the five or six things that I sampled. And so you'll see, uh, if you look through the files here, the details with all the stuff. But I had a, a mug, uh, a wine glass, a tumbler, a sugar bowl a vase and this candy dish that was shaped like a sleigh. And each one of these things was made in a different country. Not that I <laughs> had any grudge against any country, but I was just trying to find different sources of material, hopefully a different glass factory that used different, you know, starting points and whatever. Okay, so that was cool. So then I, without emptying the glass, sampled it again at three hours and found quite a bit more, 500 micrograms per liter. Uh, in most of them, and even the ones that were low before are now going up. Okay, this is much more than I was expecting. 500 micrograms per liter is, you know, it's what, 30 or 40 times what's considered the legal limit for what comes out of your tap, in, for tap water. Uh, so I emptied the glass thinking that one way we could address this problem is to try to extract as much lead as possible, dump it, and then see how the glass is after that. So I emptied the glass, refilled it with the extraction fluid, and let it sit for six days. And now we're getting really high readings. The vase, which had the highest lead concentration by percent, was very high, over 1.5 milligrams per liter. And the others were all, you know, 500 micrograms per liter. So I could have ended the study there. In fact, originally, uh, you could just say, well, look, I, I, I correlated the extraction times with the amounts that we got. One hour got you this much, three hours got you this much, six days got you this much. There's, you know, case closed. But actually, you know, I kept going and the results are interesting. So after the six day extraction, I emptied the glass and waited for about a week, then refilled it again and waited three hours and sampled that. And it's actually lower. In fact, this is the lowest measurement for the, the dark blue bar, for example, which is this tumbler. 
So it was going up with longer extraction periods, but then after this major, you know, six day extraction, it's now down. And I think what's happening here is that we're extracting all the lead that you can possibly get out of the glass. So the lead atoms are mobile, somewhat mobile in the glass, but there is a limit to that and you can't extract lead forever. I mean, eventually you will deplete all you can get out of it. However, I kept thinking, well, how much would it return? Like, would the lead actually migrate back to the surface and then you could extract more out? So I, after this last one, I put the glasses in an oven at 50 degrees C for three days. And this was to kind of simulate accelerated aging. So at 50 degrees C, the atoms are a lot more mobile in there. And if they were gonna come back to the surface over the course of you know a month or two, 50 degrees C at three days, I was hoping would be kind of simulating that. And so after this last extraction, that was actually the lowest values that I got for all of the samples. And my theory is that if you kept extracting this over time, you'd get less and less and less. And it's true over very long periods of time, the lead would migrate back to the surface and you could extract some more. But it's definitely the case where if you're concerned about using lead crystal glassware, fill it up with acetic acid vinegar and let it sit for a week, dump it out and do that again. And if you did that every week, your glass would basically always be ready to use with almost no chance of getting much lead out. I thought it would be fun to calculate the layer that we extracted from. So the idea here is we know how much total lead we extracted based on the concentration and the amount of liquid that came out of the glass. And then we also know the surface area of the glass because we just measured it with calipers. And so then we can calc and we know the density of the glass and we know the density of lead. And we know that the glass is 24% uh, lead oxide by volume or by, by mass, I guess. So 417 micrograms of glass in the extraction zone. Uh, and we know the density. And if you calculate this all out, the extraction layer thickness is about five nanometers, which is actually a very reasonable value. Um, I worked with an atomic layer deposition machine for a while and a, a 15 to 20 nanometer layer of aluminum oxide is considered a great barrier layer. So yeah, the amount of lead that's gonna diffuse through this layer is very, very small over any reasonable time scale. And as it happens, we've just been extracting it and we've depleted that layer so that there is just isn't much lead there anymore. So what's the upshot? Well, as usual, the world is pretty complicated. And if you ask someone, is, is it safe to drink from lead crystal glassware? There isn't really even a, a totally straight answer to that. One, it depends on your personal risk profile, which is probably the most important thing. And then two, if you go through all this extraction business and you keep your glass extracted at all times, it's probably gonna be pretty safe. I mean, you're, you're not gonna really get much lead out of it. But the chance is you might pour something in that has a better extraction ability. For example, I chose half a percent acetic acid because yeah, that's pretty similar to wine and, and a lot of beverages. But maybe you pour something in that has another chemical. Maybe the alcohol does something. I don't know. Um, some other, you know, beverage that's better at extracting lead. Could be. But it is interesting that the numbers line up almost, you know, we're talking about micrograms per liter. It's not like we found out that drinking out of lead is like a, a thousand times worse than drinking out of a contaminated tap or something like that. Like it's, it's all in the right ballpark. And it seems like if you had another source of lead in your life that was, you know, something you couldn't get rid of due to the water or the air you're breathing or something, the dust around your house, uh, this would actually be a fairly small incremental addition, which you may still not want, but anyway. Okay, one final note. Um, inaccuracies in my method. So I did not use cyanide in my method. And if you read the reference on the EPA approved method for using dithiazone to measure lead, you have to use cyanide because it eliminates contamination or, or um, interference from copper and nickel and mercury. Um, dithiazone, like I say, changes color in, relation, in response to all these different metals. And if you've got some dissolved copper at the same time you've got some dissolved lead, there will still be a color change and you may not be able to separate the two apart. Now my method with the coefficients and knowing the pure lead waveform, I, I think is actually a way to counter this, but really you should use cyanide too. I just didn't want to handle or dispose it. And I was thinking that using the samples that I'm, this isn't like a random um, you know, sample of river water where we don't know what it has. We're starting with ultra pure water 
just pure acetic acid and putting that into the glass. So it is possible we extracted copper and some other stuff from the glass, but I think it's much, much more likely that we extracted almost entirely lead based on what the thing is made out of. Okay, one final, final cool thing. You can actually use an XRF gun. These are designed to identify metal alloys and it shoots x-rays out and then looks at the return for characteristic spectra for, for different metals. But this actually works on lead crystal. You can actually aim this right at a piece of lead crystal and it will tell you there's a lot of lead in there because remember, this is 24% lead by mass. And this thing doesn't care what the lead is bound to chemically. It's just looking for lead atoms. Uh, interestingly, it even works on calibration solutions. So this is my stock high concentration lead calibration solution, 100 milligrams per liter. And if you aim this in here and look at the spectra, yeah, you can see a lead peak. Uh, even better, you can use that peak uh, quantitatively. Now 100 milligrams per liter is getting close to this gun's limit just because it's you know an older model and this is not really a technique that would get you down to micrograms per liter anyway. But it's still pretty cool that if you um, are unsure if you have lead crystal or not, you can aim this at it. And in fact, one of the samples in my uh, test here, the slay, I never got much extraction from. There was one spurious reading that I think didn't exist anyway, but I never extracted any reasonable amount of lead from it. And I was like, aha, I got you because the sticker doesn't even say lead crystal. It says fine crystal. And so I should add that, you know, no manufacturers really make lead crystal anymore. They all call it fine crystal. And that's because they either took the lead out entirely or they replaced it with something that isn't lead, like titanium, for example. Um, and so I thought, I got you now. The slay is not even lead crystal. But I tested it with the XRF gun and sure enough, uh, it's got a ton of lead in there. So maybe someone already extracted that one or the factory did an extraction process so that the surface is lead free. I don't know, but this is another interesting angle if you're interested in studying this stuff is to use XRF results just to quickly test uh, pieces of glass if you don't know. And then even if you are in the, um, if you're doing some kind of research that requires you to measure, you know, milligram per liter levels, it actually works great on that too. It also has this funny sound effect that really kind of belies the fact that it's actually shooting x-rays out the end there. So there's that too. All right, I hope you found that all interesting. And uh, like I say, put questions in the uh, comments and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. All right, see you next time. Bye.